Christianity hangs on one question. Did Jesus Christ actually rise from the dead? Now, if Christ did not rise, the Christian faith is merely a myth, an elusive dream, or at worst, a blatant falsehood. Now, merely because Christ claimed to be the Messiah does not really prove anything. Josephus tells us, the Jewish historian, that there were at least 12 messiahs at the time of Jesus or around that time. One of the most famous of these messiahs was a man by the name of Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba lived in the early second century, about 132 AD. He led a Jewish revolt against the Romans and was successful. It was an insurrection. And uh, they had a section of Palestine that really became a Jewish state in the time of the Roman Empire. They printed their own coins. And so just because Jesus claimed to be the Messiah did not necessarily establish the fact that he was the Messiah because, as I mentioned, there were at least 12 other messiahs beside that. The thing that makes Jesus unique is not that he was crucified. In 7 AD, the Romans crucified at least 3,000 people. So the crucifixion was really a Roman method of torture, and many other people were crucified beside Jesus. So it was not his birth that makes him the Messiah, because there are many that denied the virgin birth not the miracles that he worked because there were many that claimed they could work miracles, not the death that he died because many claimed that uh, they, the Romans crucified many others. The single thing that establishes Christ as the Messiah is the resurrection because no other so-called messianic figure could claim that he raised from the dead. So that's the key thing. Henry Morris scholar stated it well when he said, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. An English journalist by the name of Frank Morrison was fascinated with the life of Christ. And as he began to study the life of Christ, he was infected, and I think that's the right word, he was infected by the teachings of a number of, Jewish, of, of English skeptics. And so Frank Morrison said, I'm going to look at the evidence to see whether or not, from an intellectual standpoint, there is legitimate proof for Christ's resurrection. Frank Morris, this English journalist, skeptic, wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? And it's one of the most powerful books on the reality of Christ's resurrection. He lists at least seven powerful, undisputable arguments from an intellectual standpoint that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. First, he talks about the Roman soldier's testimony. Imagine this scene. The Roman soldiers are standing guard over that tomb. The earth shakes, the lightning flashes. An angel descends from heaven and says, Son, thy father calleth thee. The stone rolls away. These soldiers fall over like dead men. And they begin to run. They run through the garden gate like drunkards. They, they stagger as they are running. Their color has left them. They're, knees quake, their stomachs are in knots, they're shaking in fear for what they've just seen. And as they are running, they're telling other people, we've seen the Lord, this, this Christ, the one that was crucified, is resurrected from the dead, and they're telling others. As they do, word comes to Pilate, and Pilate demands that they come to see him. But before they go to see Pilate, the Jewish authorities sidetrack them. And these soldiers come before the Jewish authorities and they tell their story. They tell the story of the resurrection. 
The Jewish authorities bribe them and they say, when you go to Pilate, tell him that you were sleeping. Now that is a, that's one of three basic arguments against the resurrection by some of the scholarly community, that the soldiers were sleeping. That's a rather foolish argument. Even a child can see through that one. If you're sleeping, how do you know that he's resurrected from the dead? And if, the, and if these soldiers were sleeping, the other problem is that's a dereliction of duty, and immediately they would be put to death by the Roman authorities. So that argument doesn't hold. The, the testimony of the Roman soldiers was that Jesus and Christ did rise. Second thing that Morrison lists is the Roman seal on the tomb. You remember that just before Christ's death, and uh, just after his death would be more accurate to say, when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took Christ to be buried, that the Roman authorities were fearful, and particularly the Jewish priests were fearful, that somebody might take him from the tomb, that the disciples would steal his body and say that he was resurrected. And so what did they do? The Jewish priests went to the Roman authorities, and they said to them, seal the tomb. Make it as difficult as possible for somebody to steal his body. That's one of the greatest evidences of the resurrection. The tomb was sealed. Now to break a Roman seal again was a crime of civil disobedience and punishable with death. So if these soldiers are sleeping, how in the world would they not have been awakened when the disciples supposedly came to break the Roman seal, which would have put the disciples in violation of Roman law, and they would have been put to death. Third evidence is the size of the stone. The stone was between a ton and a half and uh, two tons. And when that stone was rolled into place, it was rolled down a very gentle grade. So to move the stone, one would have had to push a one and a half ton stone up a very gentle grade. Impossible. Impossible. Fourth evidence is the multiple witnesses. If you have a trial, you have to have witnesses. And when you look at the multiple witnesses of Christ's resurrection, the two Marys, Peter, John, the 12 disciples, the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, 500 other followers, these multiple witnesses testify, Christ is alive. Fifthly, the commitment of the disciples. Let's suppose the disciples made up the story for purpose of discussion. Would you die for a myth that you made up? It's rather insensical to say that they just, these disciples made up a myth, but they're willing to die for that myth. The sixth great evidence is the absence of a body. Now just think about this one. There is a theory that says the disciples went to the wrong tomb and they saw the tomb was empty. That's nonsensical because all you'd have to do is the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities is find the right tomb. You know where Christ was buried. He was buried in the tomb of Jairus of Arimathea and Nicodemus. You could easily find that. Or all you would have to do to prove that Christ wasn't resurrected very simply is find a body. Just discover his body. And, and all the nation of Rome could have easily done that. The Jewish authorities could have done that. The seventh reason is the rapid growth of Christianity. How can you explain that a few believers that meet in the upper room, 120, rock the world with the gospel because they're absolutely compelled to preach that Christ has risen? These seven evidences demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt for thinking, inquiring minds that Christ is alive. Once we have demonstrated that, then you have to ask the next question. What difference does it make? What difference does it make that Jesus Christ is alive to men and women living in the 21st century? Well, first, Christ's resurrection is essential to our faith. It's at the very heart of the Christian faith. Take your Bible, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, which will be the basis of our study this morning. 1 Corinthians, 
chapter 15. And we're looking there at verses 14, 15, 17 through 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we begin looking at verse 14. The point that we are making is that Christ's resurrection is essential to Christianity. If you are foggy about the resurrection, if that's hazy in your mind, it undermines the entire Christian faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. The word vain there in verse 14 in the original language means empty, without content, devoid of truth. So the text could read, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty of content. It is devoid of truth. Your faith has no truth in it. Verse 15, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Jesus, whom he did not raise up. In fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. You see, there was a group of Sadducees that's a Jewish cult, like you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were more conservative, Sadducees more liberal. So if you, if you do away with the resurrection, then you're really saying that not only do the dead not rise, the Pharisees didn't believe that the dead rise, rose, but you're also saying that Christ did not rise. And if Christ is not risen, verse 17, your faith is, is futile. You're still in your sins. Let your eyes drop down now to verse 18 and 19. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So he, Paul is making the argument, look, if you do away with the resurrection, you, you, all your preaching is in vain. Everything you've taught about is in vain. If you do away with the resurrection, then in addition to that, those who have fallen asleep that have died in Christ, they've perished. Verse 13, 19, if in this life we have hope in Christ, we have, are all men most miserable. Now, why is that true? Because Jesus repeatedly declared that he would rise from the dead. Jesus repeatedly declared that he would rise from the dead. And if he didn't rise from the dead, then he is a false messiah like the other false messiahs. Let's look at some of Christ's statements. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Christ was very clear. There's no doubt about it. You can underline it. You can put an exclamation point after it. You can highlight it in yellow. Christ was clear. Matthew 16, verse 21. Jesus says, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, be raised again the third day. Jesus states it clearly that he would rise again the third day. Matthew chapter 17, verse 22 Matthew 17, verse 22, verse 23. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. Again, Jesus states it. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 to 19. You see, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then he is not the Messiah. If he didn't rise from the dead, then he is a false messiah, one who merely lied. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 to 19. Thank God the evidence is abundantly plain that Jesus is the messiah. The tomb is empty. Christ is alive. The stone was rolled away. Matthew 20, verse 17. Then Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. They will condemn him to death. And verse 19, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify. And the third day he will rise again. So it is abundantly plain that Christ repeatedly declared that he would rise. So what difference does the resurrection make? First, it is the very heart of Christianity. It distinguishes Jesus from every false Messiah. Secondly, according to 1 Corinthians 15, Christ's resurrection is the believer's guarantee of eternal life. 
If Christ died on the cross, but did not conquer the tomb, then there is no guarantee that when you and I die, that we can come out of the grave alive. So if Christ did not rise, we lose every guarantee of eternal life. And that's the way Paul reasons in 1 Corinthians 15. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 22. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 20 to 22. And notice what Paul says. But now Christ is risen from the dead and have become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now let's pause there. Why does Paul say that Jesus is the first fruits of those that have fallen asleep? Were there any resurrected from the dead before Jesus died? Certainly, Lazarus, for example. Jesus resurrected from the dead a number of people. And you remember Elisha came to the Shunammite woman's son who died and raised that son from the dead. So there were those, but why is it that Jesus is the first fruits? Because Christ's resurrection was the guarantee of every other resurrection. Every other resurrection would look forward in faith to the resurrection of Christ. We look backward to his resurrection as hope. So Christ's resurrection from the dead is the first fruits in the sense that as the divine son of God, he went into the grave and he said, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it up again because you cannot kill divinity. And so here, verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also resurrection from the dead. Now in verse 22, you have two alls that are significant. For as in Adam, what's the next word after Adam? What's that word? All, for as in Adam, all die. How many die in Adam? All. Even so in Christ, what's the next word? All shall be made alive. Now in Adam, all die. As children of Adam, as sons of Adam, we inherited a sinful fallen nature. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So sin is deadly and fatal. Every single, single one of us have a deadly malignant disease that dooms us to eternal death. For all, not one or two, notice what it says in the text. It says, verse 22, uh, and verse 20, 22, for as an Adam all die, even so in Christ. Now the first all is universal, the second all is limited. Second all is not universal, because there's no universal salvation. All men and women are in Adam, but all men and women are not in Christ. So coming to Christ, we find eternal life. Coming to Christ, we find the one who promised that in him, because of his life, death, and resurrection, we can live forever. In Christ, all are made alive. There's a wonderful statement in that book on the life of Christ, uh, Desire of Ages, page 786 and 787. It says, to the believer, to who everybody, to who? The believer. Christ is the resurrection and the life. In our Savior, the life that was lost through sin is restored. For he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. He is invested with the right to give immortality. The life that he laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives to humanity. I love that statement. The life that he laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives to humanity. So on the cross, Christ bore your guilt, your shame, your condemnation. On the cross, Christ bore the guilt of sin. On the cross, Christ bore the torments of hell itself. The life that he laid down in humanity, in his resurrection, he takes up again. And that life he gives to humanity. He says, I am come, he said, that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. 
We need not fear. We need not go through life with our heads down discouraged. We need not face life hopeless because in Jesus and by Jesus and through Jesus and because of Jesus, the life that he laid down is the life that he took up. And the life that he laid down and the life that he took up is the life, his resurrected life that he gives to us. Now the third thing, the third reason the resurrection is so important is this. Christ's resurrection is the assurance that one day death will be defeated. If you do not have the resurrection of Christ, the death becomes a dark hole in the ground. The grave becomes a long night without a morning. If you don't have the resurrection of Christ, your last heartbeat is your last heartbeat. Your last breath is your last breath. Your last pulse is your last pulse. But with the resurrection of Christ, the grave is conquered. Death is defeated. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 to 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23 to 26. After Paul says in verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Verse 23, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, after those who are Christ at his coming. So Christ is the firstfruits raised from the dead. He is the one who is risen from the dead with the divine life that is within him. But after those, those that are after those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule, all authority and all power. All rule of what? All rule of sin. All authority of what? All the dominion of Satan. All power of what? The power of the grave. For he must reign till he has put all enemies. What are the enemies? The enemies of fear, worry, and anxiety. The enemies are sickness, suffering, heartache, and death. The enemies are murder and bloodshed. The enemies are the grave and the tomb. Verse 25, for he must reign till he's put all the enemies under his feet. And the last enemy, the what enemy, everybody? The last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Death. I love a little piece of prose that says this. The tomb could hold him no longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, stronger than the light, stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope triumphant say, Christ arose that resurrection day. Desire of Ages, page 530. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. He that believes in me, said Jesus, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The miracle that Christ was about to perform, you know, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, would represent the resurrection of the righteous dead. By his works, he declared himself the author of the resurrection. He who himself was soon to die upon the cross stood with the keys of death to conquer the grave and asserted his right and power to give eternal life. When Christ came out, of that too. The devil knew that his fate was sealed. I can only imagine it. That resurrection morning, the sun is shining, the sun rises in the east, painting the horizon as with a master artist's brush in flaming crimson. The birds are singing. The flowers are blooming. Israel is a beautiful place. It's gorgeous with flowers blooming in the spring. I can only imagine that scene. That morning, as the angel descends in iridescent glory, and the stone is rolled away, 
And Christ comes out of the tomb. The darkest hours just before daybreak, it had come. Christ was still a prisoner in that narrow tomb. The great stone was still in place. The Roman seal was unbroken. The Roman guards were keeping their watch. And there were unseen watchers. Hosts of evil angels gathered around that tomb. They wanted to keep Christ imprisoned, locked there, without a heart that was beating, without breath that was breathing, without a pulse that was pulsating. Hosts of evil angels gathered about that tomb. Had it been possible, the prince of darkness would have kept forever sealed the tomb that held the Son of God. But a heavenly host surrounded that sepulcher. Angels that excel in, excel in strength were guarding the tomb, waiting for the prince of life. And behold, there, there's this great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descends from heaven. Clothed with the panoply of God, the angel left his heavenly courts. The bright beams of God's glory went before him. His countenance was like lightning, raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers shook. The priests and rulers, where is the power of your guard now? Stone, what power do you have before the power of the almighty God? Brave soldiers that have never been afraid of human power are now as captives without sword or spear. The face they look upon as Jesus comes out is not the face of some mortal warrior. It is the face of the highest of the Lord's host. Jesus comes out of that tomb, iridescent with the glory of God. The earth trembles. The hosts of darkness flee. The stone is rolled away. Heaven comes down to earth. Jesus comes forth. He is the resurrection and the life. And because he has risen, we can have hope. Over 500,000 deaths in COVID-19. Some of us have lost fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers. Some of us have lost husbands or wives. And our hearts are heavy. We look back over this last year. In many instances, it's been a tough year. Tough year for many. But the good news is that father, that mother, that sister, that brother, that son, that daughter, that sleeps in the grave one day one day Jesus will come. And just as heaven's angel called Jesus forth, Mary come forth. John come forth. Harry come forth. Joanne come forth. One day the graves will open. One day we will see our loved ones again that have been believers in Christ. Why is the resurrection important? Because it is a divine testimony that death has been defeated. Fourthly, Christ's resurrection is the promise of hope beyond tomorrow. Hope beyond tomorrow. Probably some of the most magnificent verses in all the Bible on this are 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 to 54. Christ's resurrection speaks to us. There's something more to life. There's something more than getting up in the morning and wolfing down your breakfast on the way to work, hoping you'll get there on time and avoid the traffic. If you're in the Washington area, you know what I mean, particularly if you travel down the 66 or the 495. There's something more than going to work and eking out an existence there's something more than having enough money to retire on and buying a new home and a retirement home. There's something more than survival. Because here's the truth of the matter. For every one of us, if Jesus doesn't come, there's going to be a last breath. For every one of us, if Jesus doesn't come, there's going to be a last heartbeat. 
For every one of us, if Jesus doesn't come, there's going to be a time when there is no more pulse. For every one of us, if Jesus doesn't come, there's going to be a last goodbye. The last time you put your arms around your wife and say goodbye. The last time you kiss your husband and say goodbye. The last time you hug a child who's dying and say goodbye. For every one of us, if Jesus does not come, there's going to be a last goodbye. That's why the resurrection gives us such hope. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Death, according to Paul, is but a sleep. There is no passage of time. We rest until... And it's a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. Trumpets signify victory. Trumpets signify triumph. Trumpets signify glory. The battle has been won. The war is over. The conflict is finished, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised incorruptible. No more sickness, suffering, heartache, death. We shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades of the grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the Lord. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. She was only 15 years old, suddenly cast on a bed of suffering, completely paralyzed on one side, nearly blind as she lay there, Ravaged with fever, shaking from head to toe, sweating, the doctor said to her parents as they stood by the bedside holding her hand, she has seen her best days. Oh, poor child, she doesn't have much life left in her. The 15-year-old girl heard the doctor. And with all the strength she could muster, she looked up with a faint smile and said, no, doctor. My best days are yet to come when I shall see the king in his beauty. This is our hope. We won't sink into annihilation. Christ rose from the dead to give us a pledge of our own rising. The resurrection is the great antidote for death. Nothing can take its place. Riches, genius, worldly pleasures or pursuits cannot bring us consolation in a dying hour. Now there's one more thing about the resurrection that's absolutely critical. And it almost seems strange that Paul would end 1 Corinthians 15 this way. But the more you delve into it, the more you look at it, you see this last verse in 1 Corinthians 15 is like a multifaceted diamond that you hold in your hands that the sun refracts over 1 Corinthians 15, last verse, verse 58. Therefore. Now, why did it, what is the therefore, therefore? Therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Therefore, since Christ is risen. Therefore, since the grave is empty. Therefore, since Christ is alive. Therefore, since death has been conquered. Therefore, because you have a hope to live for. Therefore, because you have a purpose for a living. Therefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain. What Paul is saying is this. Since Christ is alive, you have everything to live for and everything to die for. Since Christ is alive... The power of the living Christ is yours, not only in resurrection power, but it's yours today as you walk through life. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. Paul is making an appeal to rock-like stability in the light of Christ's resurrection. The Savior is alive, and in Christ's divine power, that's available to every believer. 
His ministry in the sanctuary above, because he's alive, can hold us steady, immovable, unshakable in the face of Satan's temptations. Hebrews, fourth chapter. Hebrews chapter four. See, Paul is arguing that the resurrected living Christ, however weak you are, however sinful you are, however many times you have fallen in temptation, that this living Christ who's resurrected from the dead can hold you steady. He can hold you immovable. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then, we have a high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted like we are. Let us come boldly or confidently to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, find grace to help in time of need. What Paul is saying is, the tomb is empty. Christ is alive. And in him, we can find strength. In him, we can find courage. In him, our frailty can become enduring might. Our weakness can become strength through his eternal power. No matter how weak I find myself to be, Jesus is strong. No matter how frail this man is, Jesus is almighty. No matter how many times you failed, he can pick you up. You can be, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 58, immovable. You can be steadfast. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hebrews 7, verse 25. We look there. In Christ's life and his death and his resurrection and in his high priestly ministry, Jesus is victorious over Satan. Jesus has never lost a battle with Satan yet. Hebrews 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is able. What is Jesus? He's able. You like that song? He's able. He's able. I know my Lord is able. Therefore, he's able to save to the uttermost. How much does he save? Just a little bit? He saves to the what? Uttermost. Those who come to God through him. Why? Because he ever lives. I serve a risen Savior. He ever lives. He's resurrected. He is alive to make intercession for them. The impact of Christ's resurrection can be summed up in one word. Victory. Victory over fear of an aimless, purposeless existence. See, because Jesus lives, I can live life with purpose. Christ is alive, and that makes all the difference. You can sum up the resurrection in one word, victory. Victory over the fear of loneliness. Christ is alive. He's promised never to leave us or forsake us. Victory over the fear of powerlessness. Christ is alive, and he wants to impart strength to remain steadfast, and so he can remain immovable. Victory over the fear of hopelessness. Christ is alive. History is not some endless cycle. Christ is alive, and soon he'll come again. Victory over the fear of death. Christ is alive. The tomb is empty. And because he lives, we can live. Our victory is signed by the blood of Christ on Calvary's cross. Our victory is sealed by the resurrection of Christ. Our victory is supplied by the high priestly ministry of Christ. And our victory is secured by the second coming of Christ. That's something to sing about. A victory that's signed by the blood of Christ. A victory that's sealed by the resurrection of Christ. A victory that is supplied by the power of Christ. And a victory, a victory that is secured by the glorious second coming of Christ. Because he lives, I can face what? Tomorrow, somebody here today, that you sense that you need the hope that only Jesus can give. Resurrection is a sign of new life in Christ. Maybe you need a new beginning, a new beginning in your devotional life. Your prayer life has slipped. Your Bible study life it's kind of fallen by the wayside. Christ is alive. 
He gives us new life, places within our heart a new desire to know him. Maybe you need a new beginning, a new beginning in your marriage, a new beginning with your kids, a new beginning in some relationship. Christ is alive. He is the one of new beginnings. The great sign of the resurrection, of course, is baptism. Maybe this Easter weekend, there are those who have been thinking about it, and you're saying, Lord, soon, I want to walk into those waters and signify my life as a new beginning for Jesus. We're going to pray. If God is touching your life, you may be watching on YouTube, you may be here present. And maybe you're thinking, I need a new life in my devotional life. Would you just raise your hand now and I'm going to pray for you. Somebody needs a new life in their devotional life. You've been coming to church, but your prayer life has been slipping. Your Bible reading has been slipping. You say, Lord, I need that new life, the resurrected Christ. Maybe there's somebody here today that needs a new beginning in a relationship. Some relationship, you just say, Lord, I I just need a new beginning with that. Help me make things right with somebody else. Make that phone call, write that letter, make that visit. You need a new beginning in a relationship. Just raise your hand, I'm gonna pray for you. And maybe there is somebody here today that you've been thinking, contemplating baptism. And you just want to lift your hand and say, soon, I want to look forward to that new beginning. That symbol of the resurrection, Christ went into the grave and came out alive. And I want to go in as a symbol of the cleansing of my sin. I want to open my heart to the power of the Holy Spirit in its fullness walk with Jesus in new life. Just raise your hand and I pray for you. Father, you see the hands, you know our hearts. What a joy to know resurrection of Christ. What a joy to know the tomb is empty. What a joy to know that Jesus is alive. What a joy to know that he's coming again. That those dead loved ones that have been believers in Christ can be resurrected. We can see them again. What a joy to know that every day we can live purposeful, meaningful lives because you're alive. Send us from this place today filled with hope. May our hearts rejoice in the living Christ who is alive forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.